No, no. Well, as you can see, we're not out at the ranch. We're not out at Open Gate Bible Fellowship. Once again, we're at our home. I apologize we couldn't be out there, but there's just so much illness going on right now and so much illness in every area. And uh, we thought it's best to do the very best we can right now and with all the safeguards. And uh, we don't want to not have service. It's right now. My my wife and I and the cat are here. So I guess we're two or more gathered his name. He said he'd be with us. But we want to continue on. And hopefully next week, maybe even Thursday, we can get out, back out and have Bible study out there. But for sure Sunday night, we prayerfully hope we can get back in a regular service. Uh, we're going to continue on no matter what. We're not going to shut down. We're going to space out there. It's a large building. We, we can... Uh, be a, a part, put families together. We're disinfecting and before and after every service. And uh, we're going to go ahead with it. I believe church is essential. And uh, it amazes me that so many other things are essential, but not the church. I, I've repeated several times, not too far down the street from the, the ranch, the church we hold our meetings at, there's a, a saloon or a bar down there, and it's always wrapped around the building, and I don't see any spacing done there. It seems like those things are essential, which we know they're not. Um, I want to speak today on a message that we started last week. You can call this either continuation or part two. I'm going to use a few of the scriptures that we used last week to help set things up again, because I want to kind of get a foundational start. And we'll get into it. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to James. Hebrews, James, toward the end, of course, toward the end of the New Testament. Very important. James was the brother of Jesus. And uh, we want to continue with some of this great writing of his. He was the last of the brothers to really accept and receive that Christ was the Messiah. And when he came into faith, he really came into faith, and under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the direction of the Holy Spirit, wrote some of the greatest things for the believer. So let's do this. If you'll find James, starting off with the first chapter, we're going to be using James, the first chapter, uh, verses 26 and 27. Verses 26 and 27. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your precious word, as always. It's a light to our feet and a lamp into our path. And I pray, Lord, as we do this message, Lord, that you would, would the Holy Spirit would, would guide us and monitor what we have to say. May it be pleasing to you, and may the listener be receptible. And Lord, I pray that I would say the things that you would have me to say, whether they be comfortable or not. And Lord, we ask that the message might go forth, that the message might be received of the listener. For you say that you, that ye that have ears, let them hear. And I pray that we would would do that, whether we're speaking and whether we're listening. Lord, may we always be attentive to your word. In that precious name we pray. Amen. In the first chapter of James, verses 26 and 27, it says, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and to the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself spot, unspotted from the world. Now this isn't all of the equation, but this is certainly a good start. There's a whole lot more to it than that. I was thinking as I was studying this, I want to make some things clear, and I know there were some that would maybe not agree with me, and that's okay, we need to disagree agreeably. I know what preachers, and I've even said it myself, down through the years, that say our Christianity is not a religion. I want to make some adjustment there. Let me read something to you, and I always like to see what the dictionary has to say about a definition it says religion is belief in supernatural powers, 
which govern the universe, the recognition of God as object of worship, any system of faith and worship is religion. Now, I go along with that. But what I want to say to you, what I believe preachers are trying to say is, and I've said it myself, it's not a mere religion. But it is a religion, pure, undefiled. What makes it undefiled? The blood of Jesus Christ. We have been quickened and made alive through Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection. We've been cleansed, redeemed, saved, forgiven, saved and sanctified, set apart. That makes what we do serving the Lord to be pure because it's acceptable in his sight. A lot of people don't understand that. They get confused with righteousness and self-righteousness and what is approved of God, what is reasonable service, and what is undefiled. Anytime the flesh comes into it, the carnal nature, it gets defiled. Now that does not mean it negates our faith, but we all fall short of the glory of God. And that's what I want to talk to you about. I don't know about you, but what we're going to talk about, the tongue, I look back at things in my life, and I'm sure that you'll be honest, if you're a child of God, that we've said things, we've done things that, oh, dear God, if I could just take that back. If we could just not have it said. But once it's said, it's said. And sometimes we say things not understanding exactly what other people might be thinking that we said, and it can be offensive. Now, here's what it says, if you'll turn with me now, to the third chapter, right over across the page. I want to share this with you. It'll be the third chapter, verses 2 to 8. But before we do that, let me, let me quote some scriptures. I let... I, met, I, met, I said this last week. I started to read it before I, I caught myself. And I want to repeat it. Psalms 19.14. And once again, my dad quoted this all the time, especially if he thought I was doing something that was questionable. He'd point to me and say, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, and my Redeemer. David said in Psalms, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle. One more. This is another one. Dad quoted all the way up into the end before he passed. Matthew 12, 37. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. That's a strong, strong statement. Go with me now to the third chapter of James, right across the page. And we'll start with the second verse through the eighth. For in many things we all stumble. The same is a perfect man. Let me start again. For in many things we all stumble. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Down through the years, I've heard people say, well, you know, none of us are perfect. And that's kind of a justification to go ahead and let their mouth just flap and say and do whatever they want. I've seen even people that claim to be really spirit-filled Christians and they get their mouth engaged before their brain works. Be better off if there was a monitor. Now, we've all been guilty of it and I'm not going to sit here and try to tell you that I've got this all conquered because we all fall short of the glory of God. We all make mistakes. But just because we made a mistake does not mean 
that it's just a, 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 a lease or a license to go ahead and do, continue doing the same thing all the time. We need to be aware about this and allow the Holy Spirit to deal with us. It says the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. But you can't do that because we're not perfect. You know, there's a lot of people believe in sinless perfection. I've got news for you. That does not exist this side of heaven for the believer. A lot of people say, I don't believe that. Well, you better look again. This mortal body has not yet put on immortality. We still sin. We may, we may be saved not to sin, but we still have sin. And there's some people that say, I don't like that song, Sinner Saved by Grace. Well, I asked a man one time, he came up to the, the, the pulpit and actually was in front of the, sac the sacred desk there and the communion, and he walked up and he slammed his Bible down on the page, a table and he says, I've got a crow to pick with you. And I said, well, what is that? He said, I take great offense. You made the statement that I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm a born-again man of God. I said, well, let me ask you something. Since you got saved, did you ever sin? Well, he said, I certainly have. I said, well, I guess you could call yourself a sinner saved by grace. Now, couldn't you? A lot of people get the idea because they've, they've got some kind of a second blessing or second application of the Holy Spirit in their life. But they don't sin anymore. Boy, ridiculous. Ridiculous. This body is not going to be perfect until we get on the other side. We get a glorified body. Until then, we still have a carnal nature, even though we've been saved by grace, and thank God for that. Verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the mouth, the horse's mouth, and they that may obey us, and they turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which although they are so great and are so driven by fierce winds, Yet are they turned about with a very small helm wherever the pilot will it. I couldn't help but thinking of this. In the ministry, we've had the privilege to take nine cruises. We had the tenth one set up, and my dad was in the process, and we felt he was going to be maybe going home, and he came close to it then. So we couldn't go on that trip, that last trip to Alaska. We do those gospel cruises, and those ships that we go on are amazing. Some of those ships are 15 stories high. If you can imagine that, if you've never been on a, on a cruise ship before, imagine going up to a 15-story building and looking out over the ramparts and looking down to the ground, in this case, looking down to the water. And the amazing thing, you know, when we're in a small boat or a craft of some type or in our automobiles or a truck, and, of course, the bus, of course, takes even more space than a car or truck, and actually it's 40 foot long or a motorhome, something of that, that dimension. But anyway, when those large ships need to turn around, they will start very slowly with that rudder, those rudders on that great ship, and just a little bit at a time, making the turn until they get completely turned around. I don't know how many miles it takes, but it takes a long time to turn one of those great ocean vessels around. And here it's comparing this helm or this rudder that the helm operates that controls that whole ship. And James is comparing that with the tongue. Nations have gone to battle over tongue. We can make something alive or we can kill it with our tongue. You can tell a child that's intelligent that they're stupid, they're dumb. And if you do it long enough, you can convince them to a great extent that they're stupid and dumb. You can take a child that maybe his IQ is lower and you can build them up and make them believe that there's something and they can amount to something even if they have a very low mentality. The Bible says, so a man thinks he is, so he is. We're not Christian scientists, but there's a whole lot to be said about the mind. The mind connected to the tongue and the heart of God speaking to our heart, bearing witness with us. Verse 5, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter 
a little fire kindling. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. I was thinking as I was studying this, just this last year, along with this pandemic and all of those other things that have taken place, and the riots and the burnings, I was thinking about these fires that we've had in these forests, how many millions of acres, hundreds of thousands into millions of acres that have been destroyed in the homes. And yet just a little spark was all that it would take to ignite. I never will forget, it's been about a year and a half, two years ago, I had taken the bus over to a, a bus truck yard to get some work done. And I was out in the, the lot, and all of a sudden, right next to the place of business was an off-ramp for the freeway. And a car went by, and there was a spark off of that car that ignited the brush that was around that freeway, and it caught those trees, and in a matter of seconds, the tree was aflame, and it moved over to the other trees in a matter of about 15 to 30 seconds. It was an unbelievable fire by a spark. Once again, James compares the tongue with even a spark, a fire. A world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Strong statements. For every kind of beast and of birds, and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed by mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly, evil, full of deadly poisons. People might say, okay, you've made your point. What does the child of God do? What does he do about it? Now, I want to be careful with what I'm going to say because I don't want to step on anybody's position and get the wrong idea. There's a lot of people believe because they have attained to some spiritual realm or they have some special gifting that they have been lifted into an arena that other people are just not there. Now, there is a special place in the Lord by being a spirit-filled believer. But there's a real danger when we get so caught up in our gifting and our gifts that we think that we have reached some ethereal place and that we have risen above these other people and all of a sudden it becomes a pharisaical, indignated, spiritual bigot that's self-righteous. Our righteousness are filthy rags in the sight of God. So how do we deal with this? First of all, there's nothing above the Word of God. The Word of God and the Holy Spirit, and anyone that's followed my ministry and my teaching, you cannot separate the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. They're more than galvanized, and I've used that a lot, but they are incorporated. You cannot separate them. It is impossible. The way we overcome is by the blood of the Christ, the word of the testimony, and that all happens through the word of God. We are made clean through the word. That's another name for Jesus Christ. We put on the whole armor of God. All of the implements. We've talked about this so much, and it's so important the helmet, helmet, the 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 vest plate, all of the, all of the articles. But there's one that is very important. Every one of them point to the Word of God. But let me tell you, one that really stands out to me personally it says, "Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel." 
That's not the denomination that you might be raised in. It's not your favorite church or your favorite doctrinal belief, but it's what thus saith the Word of God. And this is where a lot of people get tripped up. Some people put more confidence in their home church than they do the Word of God. I've heard some people say, well, that's the way we've always done it. It doesn't matter what the Word of God, this is how we've always done it. You might think this is a little hard, but it's not hard. God does not appreciate his word being tampered with. In fact, he says, if you add to or take away, let them be accursed. That's what it says in Galatians. I want to be very careful as I teach and preach this word and as I sing it, especially as I preach it. I want to make sure that I am getting as close to what the word of God says that I can possibly get. And by the way, we're always making corrections. Anybody that thinks that they've got it all under con control and they know it all, you better watch out for them. Because we see through a glass darkly and God is evermore speaking to us. I look back at things that I was preaching and I didn't say necessarily that something was wrong, but it wasn't totally right and it wasn't complete. I used to make a statement. The weight of sin that death so easily be said. Well, that's what it says, but there's something more to be said. It says the weight and the sin that does so easily be said us. You see, when you tamper with it and you're flirting with it, there's weight there already. And when you go ahead and do it, boy, you got to talk about a double whammy. You got a lot more whammy than that because now you're involved in it and it becomes lust of the flesh. We need to be careful how we look into this word and rightly divide it. We need to ask the Holy Spirit, show us, Lord, in your word, how we are supposed to react, how we're supposed to treat one another, how we're supposed to respond. Lord, let our yea be yea and our nay be nay. Help us to know when it's time to open our mouth and when it's time to shut our mouth. Help us to know. And the only way we're going to know that is being led by the Holy Spirit and the word of God. That's the way we're going to know. Because we're going to find out what is the real fruit of the Spirit. And I think we may talk about that next week. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, self-control. Against such there is no law. A lot of people are caught up. They're always seeking for something. What about, what about looking into the Word of God and having an understanding and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us that we might have the fruit of the Spirit? that we might know how to walk with him, might know how to talk with him, know how we're supposed to pray. It tells us in this word. It tells us in this word. It's the engrafted word. That's what it says in James 1, 21. 1, 21. Let's take a look at that. Let's go back to that. Let's go back to 1, 21. I have to be careful. These pages are so fragile. This is a Bible. My parents got me years ago. I was starting to fall apart, but I just, I'm hoping I can find someone that can rebind it. James 1, verse 21. Wherefore, put away all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Remember what I said earlier? He sent his word and he healed them. We're made clean through the word. That's also, don't forget, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The Savior says, and the same was in the beginning. They're all tied together. It might be hard theologically if you understand it biblically, but it's there. That's what it says, and that's what it means. You know, it tells us in the Bible, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. It says in the 20th verse, and let's read that, verse 1, verse 20. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. We need to let God take care of the business that needs to be taken care of. We need to do our part 
and let God take care of it. And pray to him once again, Lord, let me be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. That connects with Ecclesiastes, the third chapter. There's a time for everything. It goes along with what we're talking about. That's another good message we'll bring out some other time. A message for all of us. It says in Isaiah 53, 1, Who hath believed our report? And whom is the arm of? Who trusts that? Who leans on that arm? You know who that arm is? The Lord. It says, the arm of the Lord, revelation. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arm. What a great old song. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarm. No matter what's going on in our society, in our government, we need to pray for our government. There's some decisions that need to be made here in the, this next week, two and a half weeks, one this week and then between now and the 20th. Christians need to be praying. It's not too late. Who's going to believe our report? we talked about reports the word of God will you believe the report that Jesus Christ came to this earth he was there all the time but God himself became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory we just celebrated a few days ago the birth of Christ some over 2,000 years ago Will you believe the report that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost? Will you believe and accept the fact that he died on the cross, shed his blood, rose again on the third day for your justification and for mine to make us clean in his sight, acceptable, even though we're frail and make mistakes? That part he's cleansed. We still have that nature, as I talked about before, but if you've never received Christ, would you consider giving your heart to the Lord? This world's not our home. We're just passing through. We didn't know Christ as Savior. Our Lord's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. And I pray that you'd consider giving your heart to Christ. You don't have to have anybody pray for you. You can do it on your own. Just say, Lord, I recognize I'm a sinner. Come into my heart. Forgive me my sin. I want to be with you forever in eternity. Because he says, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And he says, I'm ready to receive you. And when that time comes, he calls us home. We want to be able to say good night here, but good morning up there. Lord, I pray for these that are listening. And I know this message is going out and will continue to go out. And I pray, Lord, that those that have not received Christ, Lord, that they may, may yield and give their heart to you. May they receive you as Lord and Savior. Because there is a life after this one. We're just passing through. This world's not our home. We're just passing through. And you've laid up for us a place in heaven if we know you as Savior. I pray that folks might receive Christ even tonight as they would listen at any other time to this message. Lord, for those that have walked away and been in a backslidden condition, Lord, I pray that they'd come back in the fold. And Lord, for those that tonight that are in need, as for the people in our own church that are that are sick and suffering and uh, they need a touch from you, I pray for my wife. She's going through what she's going through. I pray that you might touch her body. But before Ring Garoni, continue to touch her with his cancer and with Carol and uh, Wilson. And uh, Lord, I, I pray for... Um, John Roberts should just his wife went home glory to be with the Lord I pray you be with that whole family and Lord I I, I, I pray also for Janine's son Lord I, I pray that you do a work in his life I pray I pray for Mary Corrine's daughter Lord I, you know about it it's unspoken but Lord I thank you for those that 
took the time to listen and those that might listen in the future. I pray that this message might mean something to them. Those that have ears to hear, I pray that they might hear. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to present your glorious gospel. Even though we have to do things in the, the, the strenuous situation that we're not out with the congregation, but Lord, we're doing the best we can and continue to keep on keeping on. We're not going to shut the church down in spite of all of this pandemic and all these restrictions. I pray, Lord, that our legislators would see the need to open these churches back up and let us do safeguards and continue. Lord, we're, we're, we're still doing it anyway, but we're doing it with a lot of caution. And Lord, I just pray that you'd continue to bless the people and answer these prayers according to your plan and purpose. In thy precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you tonight for listening. Lord bless you. And I hope you'll tune in again. We've gone back to 6 o'clock in our services. 3 o'clock just was not working in spite even of this bad weather that we've had. But we're going to go ahead some way, somehow, go back to 6 o'clock on Sunday night. We have a Bible study course on Thursdays. And we have a Sunday night service. And we do that because a lot of churches don't have a Sunday morning. And this enables me also to do my evangelistic work as long as the pandemic will be able and the churches allow me to come. And of course, that's been a real hindrance here this last year going on almost a year now. Lord bless you once again. Thanks for listening in. Have a good evening.